The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. A uh, very good morning to you all, and thank you very much for joining this, our StorageCraft partner broadcast. StorageCraft, where your data is always safe, always accessible, and always optimized. Before we go any further, if you're uh, having difficulty seeing my screen, or indeed, if you have difficulty hearing me, please let me know. So my name is John Brennan. I'm the Chief Sales Engineer for StorageCraft here, and I'm calling you from our Cork office here in Ireland. And today's broadcast is based around five things you didn't know about StorageCraft. Now, I'm the trainer for StorageCraft, and I have been delivering training in the region for about the past five years. And this webinar is as a result of you know, comments and feedback from all of our partners, just like yourselves, who've attended the course and have come back to me and said, well, these are the things that I had to change when I went back into the office based on the content of the course that was delivered and based on the certification that they attained. And really what I'm trying to do this morning is pick out five of the top items that you, the partners, came back to us with and told us that you know everyone should uh, you know needs to know this and everyone should basically be running their systems in this way so we've picked out five of the top if you like items that um, you the partners have come back to us with and the first one is in no particular order build a bdr now a lot of our partners uh, were not using a bdr and um, they were just installing uh, individual, if you like, SPX or uh, SP5 uh, on all of the individual machines, and they didn't have an actual dedicated backup and disaster recovery server. And that's what that means, a backup disaster recovery server. Now, why build a BDR instead of just using a NAS or, or a USB drive? Well. A BDR will be your center of excellence and it will be your method of accessing each customer site as a partner to basically perform the basic tasks of, you know, a virtual boot, of doing file and folder restore, of checking uh, machines, etc. Now, with the BDR in place, it means this becomes a very efficient process, given that you resource the BDR correctly. Whether you buy it or build it, that depends on what the customers, the end users uh, pocket will, will, will afford, basically. Uh, the considerations would be cost, reliability, capacity, and performance. So if you put some kind of secondhand 15-year-old compact machine in there and expect that to do the job of a brand new SQL environment that has basically gone down and you're going to use this compact 15 years old to take over, uh, that probably won't happen. So really you need to look at, you know, what is the budget for this end user? Can you offer them you know, a decent enough system to bring up one machine at a time, you know, two machines concurrently, five machines concurrently, and how reliable is that going to be in that event? So what are the considerations? Well, consider the following when building a BDR. The amount of processor or RAM that you're going to need, the storage space and configuration, the operating system and virtualization, storage craft components, location, the network, security and off-premises strategy if indeed you have one now there's an, a really good article out there uh, written by a, a, a colleague of mine called brett twigs on how to build a bdr so i suggest that you go and and look at that and possibly uh, read that before you actually go and 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 do it uh, and it implement your BDR. So how can I scale uh, the storage for my BDR server? Well, that's simple. We have a new product now, and it's called OneBlocks. And it's a simple scale-out um, storage with scale-out capabilities, which will enable immediate provisioning of storage. 
and you can start with one and this is called a ring or a cluster whatever you want to call it and that can be increased as you grow uh, you can start off with just one box with possibly you know six drives in it and you can add drives as you require them and those drives can be you know they can be resourced locally uh, you don't have to purchase those drives for those drives from from us uh, those drives can be as i said located locally and at, at a price that makes sense to you and you can add those to your server as you go and mix and match so what's the second point that our partners made to us with regards to things that they had to change when they found out about our features and functions within the storage craft well that was shadow control Shadow control to some partners has been an absolute revelation and it enables them to centrally manage their whole environment. If you have multiple customers, it doesn't matter whether they only have one or two servers on each site, shadow control is free and it enables you to use the free appliance to absolutely maximize your management capability across multiple sites. It's usually installed at the MSP or VAR office, and it comes in two parts. There's the actual shadow control appliance for off-premises uh, data center installation, and then there's the actual en uh, endpoint agents that are installed on all of the endpoints and all of the customer sites. And you simply subscribe that uh, uh, endpoint to the uh, appliance on the DOR site uh, over uh, the WAN. You don't have to have uh, links, you're using ports to connect. And with regards to the application, it is absolutely simple. You do not have to install any applications at all. It is a fully formed ISO and you can make it into a physical or virtual machine. Uh, the installation files are downloaded from StorageCraft and the shadow control installers include the shadow control appliance builder 4.0 ISO and then the shadow control endpoint agent. So basically what you're able to do is you're able to go and manage and monitor all of your uh, 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 components on your BDR server as well, including image manager um, from your shadow control. As you can see here, there's my storage craft image manager status. Uh, install image manager seven or newer. You can only be installed with a, on a Windows BDR and it's recommended to use the latest version. Install Shadow Protect SPX console where there's no license required. And that's important as well. When you're building your BDR, to go back to the previous point, it shouldn't actually have a cost above and beyond the actual cost of the hardware to build that BDR. Why? Because you do not need to license the SPX installation on that BDR, simply because you're not actually backing anything up. You're using the recovery features within SPX on that BDR to go and recover environments, to do file and folder recovery, to do a uh, full bare metal restore as well. So basically, and virtual boot, most importantly, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is just a quick map as to your on-premises data center and your off-premises data center and how it's all linked together. And the very basic explanation of this is it's, it's a client server architecture where you have the ISO, where you have the appliance uh, installed on the DOR site on a physical or virtual machine. Now, usually it's a virtual uh, environment that it installs on. You just go in and make it a, an actual virtual machine. As soon as it's created, then you just access it using the URL of that machine. Okay. Now I have one here. So I'm into my shadow control here. And as you can see, it's giving me a kind of an overview here of the shadow protect status, the image manager status. I don't have any in uh, being monitored at the moment. And my shadow control status. Uh, one of the really cool features here is the ability to just discover all of your client machines using a CFV, CSV file. And once you have that, uh, all the devices discovered, you can then start pushing out SPX, 
Shadow Protect itself, uh, if you're using version 5, Image Manager or a Shadow Control Agent onto those machines. Now, it is a lot, a lot more features and functions. I won't go into them all now. Uh, some of them are really cool with regards to you know status rule policies. So instead of going to each individual machine, you're now collating all of that into a central management structure and you're applying all of your rules, all of your thresholds across all of your customer devices to your status rule policies. And you can create different policies for different organizations. And that's important to note as well, that we can divide into customer one, customer two, customer three, and apply specific status rule policies to those customers and to have the specific devices relating to that customer visible within their account here or within their organization. Uh, there's also reports, there's really nice reports that you can you can generate. There's a little bit of capacity planning that you can do here with additional forecast based on recent usage for the next three, six and 12 months, for instance. So altogether, it's a, a really easy, free, did I say free? I'll mention it again, it's a free package to centrally manage your whole environment within a, a, a uh, within a, a central area, within your Dior site. So you have the ability to go and manage all of your customers centrally. Uh, I mentioned the push install and the shadow control sources, uh, managed endpoints, discovery by CSV file, discovery by system center plugin or discovery by vCenter plugin. So shadow control also integrates with your VC or your Microsoft System Center as well. If you have them, you can integrate it so that you can actually do all of this then from your VC for your Microsoft System Center. It creates an additional page once you have Shadow Control installed and you use the plugin into those uh, virtual environments. It means then you're not swapping back and forth into different products, okay? So your backup stores are created as well. So when you're creating jobs, and this is the other really cool thing about Shadow Control, is it's like creating a local job, only you're creating a central job and then you're able to deploy it with one click of a button to multiple machines, 50, 60, 100 machines, okay? Uh, you can create and manage your backup stores, which are the destinations on each of those customer sites and manage all of those centrally within Shadow Control as well. Okay, again, one of the other points made by our partners uh, who came back to us and told us that, you know, this was something else that they weren't aware of uh, because they've used the product for so long. I guess it's like anything else. If, if, it, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. That's a pretty good adage, something that I tend to live my life by as well. But having said that, it's good sometimes just to go back and review what you've done day one and make sure that you've done it correctly, right? So... Tuning image manager is just one of those things that you need to possibly look at. Um, the agent settings for performance, you go to your image manager, agent settings and performance, and look at your agent throttling. You increase or decrease the number of CPU cycles available to image manager. If this is on a BDR, put it to high, put it to 100%. It comes up at default at 50% anyway. Um, if you're sharing it with another product, you really shouldn't be because image manager you know, should be sitting on a BDR and should be at 100%. That means that it just processes absolutely everything um, and much faster, much more um, um, efficiently, okay? Uh, concurrent processing controls the number of jobs and folders Image Manager works on at the same time, okay? So again, you may need to look at that setting as well. Uh, there's also our new DTX log that you can use and uh, uh, it'll give you uh, uh, tuned to optimal settings when you run it regarding paging files, regarding memory management, a landman server and TCP IP. So you can use DTX to make the recommended changes. So just DTX assimilate and then I accept. And again, this is just to give you the guide all of the actual instructions on DTX are on our site. And then choose the correct replication mode within Image Manager. That's also extremely important. And why is that important? Um, because it can mean the difference between having a synchronized offsite 
for your disaster recovery images and an offsite DR that's possibly one day out of sync. Okay. Uh, is an off-premises image manager being used to consolidate your images? That's the first question you're going to be asked. It should be yes. Uh, if it's no, um, I don't know why, <laughs> but basically image manager is free and you should be answering yes to that. But then when you answer yes, yes, I have an image manager on my local site and I have an image manager on my Dior site. So what should I be configuring? It's giving me two answers. It says yes, replicate only consolidated images. And it says yes, replicate only original unconsolidated intra-daily images. Okay. Well, if we choose the first one, replicated only consolidated images, well, guess what? In Image Manager, and let's have a quick look at Image Manager here. If we go into the agent settings and go into performance here, uh, or into general, uh, you'll see here that 12 o'clock every day is the default setting, 12 o'clock at night, that is. Okay, that's a.m. Um, so 12 o'clock at night is pretty much when we run the processing for that particular day, okay? If you choose the first option there, okay, you have to wait until the images are consolidated before they're actually replicated. That consolidation will not occur until 12 o'clock at night. Okay, if you want a synchronized on-site, off-site, that's a problem. That won't happen. However, if you choose this second option, which is yes, replicate any original unconsolidated intraday image files, it means then <clears throat> when your images hit your uh, backups folder, and let's have a quick look at, at mine for those of you who um, may not know what that looks like okay so there's all my incrementals and there's my last backup it happened today is indeed the 23rd and it, um, it but anyway uh, what happens is uh, as it hits there the next thing that will happen is once I have my replication job set up with an image manager it will automatically replicate from the on-site to the off-site. It's not going to wait until it's consolidated, okay? So that means if I choose this particular option, I have a fully synchronized site. So worst case scenario, if the whole site goes down, the local site goes down, and all I'm left with is the DR, I'm able to go back to the last replicated image, which hopefully was possibly about 15 minutes ago. If I choose this option, I'm going to have to go back to yesterday. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And again, a lot of this is, you know, talking with the, the customer as well, trying to figure out what are the expectations. You all know what a, your RPO, recovery point objective is, and your recovery time objective. Okay, so all of these schedules that you're setting up, how often am I backing up the server? And basically, how am I replicating? And how often am I replicating? All of this feeds into the recovery time objective, the recovery point objective as well. Uh, just a little uh, um, aside, we have uh, improved the views into Image Manager, and so you're able to easily locate your replication jobs now. The replication jobs appear under the expanded Manage folder, and Image Manager has a 15-minute retry timer if there are connection failures. Finally, recover using Virtual Boot. And any of you who've attended any of my courses for the past five years will know, I want you to test. I want you to test and I want you to test again, okay? Why is this important? Because I have had customers who, you know, incorrectly set up jobs, okay, for their end users. 
And it's taken them months and months to figure out that the job wasn't even running correctly. They never set up any notifications. They never set up, app, they, they set up absolutely nothing around the job. They just set up the first job and then they let it run and then they forgot all about it, right? Unfortunately, it wasn't set up day one. No notifications were set up either. If you're not testing, if you're not constantly testing your environment, this is not a disaster recovery solution. What it is, is a job you set up a couple of years ago and never revisited, right? And when that actual end user needs to come back and use our product to do a full restore, because it wasn't set up correctly day one, it may not function. However, we have automated that process. I'll talk to you a little bit about it in a moment uh, and make it, make it very, very easy for you guys to constantly, constantly test your backups and be notified in the event of a failure as well. Virtual Boot with VirtualBox was our very first Virtual Boot feature. For those of you who are not aware of what Virtual Boot is, it just means then that we're able to bring up a machine really quickly in a virtual environment in the event of the production server going down. It just means then, for instance, if it's a physical server, and you have to wait for a lead time of a couple of days to get the new machine on site, you have this virtual machine in a temporary environment running that everyone can access. The beauty of the system is so that all of the data that's changed on that server for the two days lead time, for instance, on the new server, well, we can capture all of that data and we can add it to the bare metal restore when the new machine comes on site in, in two days time. So prior to this type of function being available, you would have had to just, you know, either try and build a new one straight away, which could take a day anyway, or just wait for the machine to come two days later and be down a server. But now with VirtualBox, as, and this feeds back into my very first point, which I think is probably the most important of the five, besides the test, 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 of course, is the BDR. So if you're building a BDR and you have it resourced correctly, it's gonna run this virtual environment correctly with VirtualBox, okay? However, if you build your BDR with a 2012 uh, server, for instance, or two, and you have a virtual environment and the hypervisor running in there, you can virtual boot using that Hyper-V now. So it requires the image files local to Hyper-V system. The images cannot be across the network like a NAS. If the hardware changes during a manual HSR may need to reactivate or reissue uh, if MSP or for virtual uh, boot and again when failing back to original new hardware. That's just to do with, with your hardware changes based on the licensing model that we have as well. But basically the message I'm getting across to you is if you're building a BDR, if it's a 2012 for instance uh, 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 OS that you're sticking on it uh, and you're going to have a, a Hyper-V environment running on it, well then you can use virtual boot in that environment as well. If you or the customer then are using a vSphere environment, you can also now utilize your vSphere environment to virtually boot as well. So we've developed through VMware VIO program a method of bringing your machine up in a temporary environment and then ultimately by just creating a snapshot in a permanent environment within a VMware, within vSphere. Okay, it'll uh, it's certified as a VMware ready. You instantly virtualize backup images as guest VMs directly on the VMware ESXi hosts. You migrate physical systems or VMs to ESXi with minimal downtime. And advanced verification. This is what I'm talking about with regards to the ability, uh, um, um, uh, the ability to go and to um, 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 use an automatic method of uh, running your advanced verification. So advanced verification uh, in Image Manager allows you to boot new consolidated daily, weekly, or monthly image files, okay? And what it'll do is it'll capture it in the background. And let me revert back to my actual backups, and I should have some residue screenshots here. There's one here straight away. So what it'll do is it'll just take a snapshot of your environment and allow you then to email that to you, to the partner or, or the end user, whoever you want it to email to, to show that 
all of the servers on that site then are bootable after the consolidation has occurred okay it'll actually run this um, uh, verification so this advanced verification has something that our partners have looked at looked for for quite some time um, okay so I have one or two questions here in the back end but first I want to talk to you and we'll try and get to those questions in a moment but first we'll get to uh, what I would like you all to do as next steps out of all of this if possible okay we have free online training and certification available for everyone on this call okay it could be at a sales level through the Academy okay so all of our training and certification you go into your portal you go into your academy and here you see your academy online training if you have engineers there uh, you can do that or if you have salespeople you can actually go and prepare online there's an introduction online course storage grant introduction and then you have your sales professional online course and then you can take the sales professional online exam and become sales uh, storage craft sales certified we also have another track for engineers. So again, you have the online course, StorageCraft introduction. You have StorageCraft engineers course, that's course 300 when you go into your academy, okay? And then you'll be able to sit the online exam, which is the 360E StorageCraft engineer exam course, okay? And then, you will eventually be able to sit the Storagecraft Masters Engineer, which is currently being designed and is not actually available. Okay. So let's uh, go and uh, go to some of the uh, uh, questions that I have here. And the first one is, why is there two, and this is obviously from an experienced partner, so this is for, for from Dave, and it's saying, why do we have two recovery environments? Well, the reason we have two recovery environments is one is the Windows recovery environment that you have to build to the RE Builder, and the other is an already formed ISO, and that is our cross-platform recovery environment. The cross-platform recovery environment will cover Linux as well as Windows um, uh, um, uh, devices. Okay, and uh, it, it is a ready formed ISO. However, the Windows platform has to be created. So we give you the tools to quickly go and create the Windows ISO. Now, may I give a little piece of advice as well here to all of my partners who are listening. The Windows environment is a little bit better than the cross platform with regards to functionality. So the features that you have in the Windows recovery environment are a little bit more advanced in the sense that you can add drivers, you can use the boot configuration utility. They, those features don't exist yet in the cross-platform. I'm sure they will at some point, but currently they don't exist in the cross-platform environment. May I give you all a piece of advice? And this is what I tell all the partners as well on the course. Would you ever today go and create an ISO, your Windows recovery environment ISO and get the ISO or get it onto a bootable USB or get it onto a DVD and have one on each of your customer sites. At least then in the event of an outage, the head start will be that you actually have the recovery environment created to begin with, okay? And that can be done absolutely today. Okay, here we go. There's another question here from Mark, and can you use Windows 10 for the Hyper-V host? Let's think about this for a moment, all right? Okay, so I take it that you're asking me if you can use, also in that question is hidden, the question, can I use Windows 10 as a BDR? Um, of course you can, technically you can do all of that, right? However, if you have a site where, and I forget exactly how many concurrent users can access a, a desktop OS, right? I think it may be five or seven, I'm sure somebody will correct me somewhere down the line. If you had say 20 users and you've decided to deploy a BDR with Windows 10, you may run into issues when they're all trying to use the same server that's booted in that environment. However, if you're using a server OS, this will not become an issue at all. Some NAS boxes in the past have just got the basic, what's known as the Windows Storage OS, that's absolutely fine. 
Um, we used Sentinel boxes from WD at one stage, which weren't great, but un ultimately they had the OS installed as well. So you had a ready-baked BDR machine there, if you like. And keep your eyes on this space when it comes to uh, BDR machines and that as well. You never know what will happen and how our OneBlocks uh, uh, product line will develop as well. Okay. Another question from Robert. This advanced verification needs the option to extend the screenshot wait time beyond 30 minutes hmm i i don't think let's have a look and see what it extends to to begin with because i wouldn't have that off the top of my head but i, I usually don't have it beyond um, um kind of 50 you know five minutes or so is, is usually okay for me but let's go in and have a look and uh five Yeah, it goes as far as 30 minutes. Really, you need to take a look. I'm sure that's something we can pass on, and you can get onto our new forum as well, and you can make that point, uh, Robert, as well. But I would remember now what we're doing here. We're just taking the chain of images, right? And all we're doing is we're going to virtually boot them in the background. We don't actually bring them up as such, and we're just taking a screenshot, and that screenshot's being emailed. I would be more interested in, in getting a, a look and having a look at your actual uh, chain, okay? So when the chain is 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 uh, uh, running, and that it's not consolidating and, and booting and sending that email off within the 30 minute frame, which is pretty standard. Uh, I, I've not seen a machine where I've had to push it out to 30 minutes yet. However, that is I'm sure possible, but I would also, have to question what's happening with that chain as well. Okay, so another question here, and guys, I'm not gonna to get to, there's a load of questions that are coming in, which is fantastic, and thank you so much. But what we'll do is uh, we'll try and respond to these in, in reply to the email that we're gonna send out to you after this, okay? But let me have a quick look here. So Gian, when is the new shadow control coming, and will it allow different alert times for different types of machines? So, yes. Um, absolutely. Um, you're going to find that our product is going to be, you're going to see huge changes. We had a, an absolute huge investment. We had a great team of people come on board. We're making leaps and bounds in the development of this product. And I think you're going to be shocked when you see what's coming next. It's absolutely fantastic. I can't tell you a whole lot about it now, which is killing me. But having said that, listen, it's, 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 um, uh, it's all absolutely fantastic when you see uh, what's coming next and that will include if you like a new uh, gian as gian is asking here a new interface as well with a whole new way of of of, of looking at all of this so uh, again uh, gian asks will the new shadow control also uh, cover cloud services not really not the new shadow control and again i can't go in too much about this but there is a ui on the way that will do that how about that? That's me being very diplomatic here, okay? Uh, uh, and it doesn't boot up. Okay, guys, we're actually after running over uh, by by uh, by a few minutes, and and I'm not going to get to absolutely uh, 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 all of these questions. There's a bunch of questions, and and I'm very much uh, delighted that you're asking me. I will actually get to all of these questions that have come in, and I will respond to them all. And uh, uh, thank you so much for, for uh, attending today and being so engaged. Uh, we probably maybe need to leave more time next time for uh, to, to handle all of the questions uh, live. But I will certainly get to your, your questions each individually um, uh, after, this, uh, after this session and, and certainly by the end of, of this week. Well, again, listen, thank you very much for joining. I hope you found that useful. It, it was lovely to be, I suppose, engaging with you all again. And uh, I'll hope to talk to you all soon. Bye for now.